Hi, and welcome back to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. Before we get started today, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. I just wanted to give you an update about CrimeCon. We're still going ahead, but there has been a change of date due to COVID restrictions still being in place in the UK until late June. It's now taking place on Saturday, September the 25th and Sunday the 26th at the same venue in London. Everything else will be the same. Same amazing speakers, podcast row and experiences. You'll be able to deep dive into unsolved cases, speak to experts and meet other true crime enthusiasts. If you already have a ticket, it will be transferred over to that date. Or there is a COVID guarantee if it needs to be changed again or you can't make that date and need to be refunded. If you haven't bought a ticket yet and want to, you can use my code UNSEEN for 10% off. I can't wait to see you all there in September. So, getting back into the case. Today is the second part in a two-part series about the disappearance of Susie Lamplew in London in 1986. If you haven't listened to the first part, I would recommend that you go back and listen to it first. We left the last episode with the name John Canan a man who would become the police's prime suspect in Susie's disappearance. And today we're going to explore his background and why he was of interest and also look at the timeline for the investigation into Susie's disappearance, where it is now and other possible theories. I want to thank Paul from the True Crime Enthusiast podcast for reading our disclaimer today. If you haven't already listened to his fabulous podcast, have a look at the link in the show notes. The episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Susie's case had come to somewhat of a standstill in the months after her disappearance. There was no evidence as to where she had gone or with who. The only name that police had been given was John Canan, which had been passed on to the investigation by a Reading police officer. This officer believed that Canaan may have had something to do with Susie's disappearance. However, this was dismissed initially and was not seriously looked into. There were a series of events, however, that would lead police to once again look into the name that they had been given. One of the questions was who was John Canaan and why exactly had he been put forward as a suspect in the first place? Canaan was from the area of Sutton Coldfield in Birmingham and had been brought up in an affluent and relatively well-off family. He'd been given many opportunities to succeed in life, however this was not the path that Canaan had chosen to follow. He had become involved with crime from an early age, having indecently assaulted a woman in a phone box at the age of just 14. His record with police continued into violent crime when in March 1981, he committed an awful rape at knife point of a woman who worked in a knitwear shop in Sutton Coalfield. The terrible thing about this crime is that the woman had been in the shop with her 17-month-old baby, and Canaan had threatened the baby before assaulting the mother, despite her desperate pleas that she was pregnant. This was a chilling crime, and one that firmly planted Canaan on the police's radar. He was apprehended for the rape, convicted and sent to prison. He had also had problems in his personal life. Despite getting married, it didn't last and he continued to have relationships with other women after leaving the marriage. These women also reported assault and violent behaviour. This record was a large reason behind why he had been suggested as a possible suspect in Susie's disappearance and possible murder. His violent background appeared to fit with the type of offender that would have committed this crime. There was also another reason why he had been put in the frame. Canaan served his sentence for the rape in Sutton Coalfield and was released from prison in 1986 into a prison hostel in West London. While at the hostel, he was allowed day release to attend a job at a props company in the area. Crucially, Canaan was released from this hostel on the 25th of July, just three days before Susie went missing. Not only did it appear that Canaan had a violent background, but he was also in the area at the time that Susie disappeared. 
The fact that the investigation dismissed him was a source of conflict for many of the officers involved, and it would become an even more important line of inquiry when police found out about his later crime. Shirley Banks was from the Clifton area of Bristol and worked as a manageress at a textile factory. In 1987, Shirley was 29 years old and had got married in September of that year to her husband, Richard. Unfortunately, the marriage would be cut short when on October the 8th, Shirley disappeared. The day had started out like any other and that evening, Shirley went to Broadmead Shopping Centre in Bristol City Centre for some late night shopping. She went into Topshop and bought a blue and white patterned dress before bumping into some friends from work in the shopping centre at around 7.45pm. She had arranged to meet her husband for a drink that night, however she didn't turn up. Richard was concerned about this and checked with the bar staff at the pub, but nobody had seen her. He went back home to check she wasn't still there, however she wasn't there either. Richard decided to wait at home in case she returned, but she never did. He went to work the next morning and when he got in he phoned Shirley's workplace in the hope that she may have gone to work as normal. He didn't get the answer that he had been expecting. He was told that Shirley had rang up before nine o'clock that morning and told them that she had a stomach upset and wouldn't be in that day. Her colleague told him that he assumed she'd be at home. This, however, was news to Richard, as Shirley had not returned home at all after her shopping trip the night before. The police became involved with Shirley's disappearance, as it was so unlike her and out of character to just not tell anyone where she had gone. Officers were on the hunt for her car, as she had travelled to Broadmead Shopping Centre in her orange Mini Clubman, and must have parked it in a car park somewhere nearby. It was at this point that they connected another incident that had happened the day before Shirley had gone missing. A woman named Julia Holman had returned to her car in the city centre. When a man approached her, she put her keys in the ignition. He opened the car door and pointed a gun at Julia. He told her that if she did what he told her to do, she wouldn't get hurt. Julia, however, acted quickly and managed to push the man out of the car and drove off. This was evidently an attempt to assault or even kidnap her, and she was very shaken up by it. The police therefore were aware that there was a man in the area that was approaching women as they got into their cars, and worryingly, he was armed. Officers believed that this lead was important in Shirley's disappearance, and kept it in mind when carrying out a search for her car. Her case was featured on Crime Watch and the details of her disappearance were detailed. One of the things that police needed to find was her car and the registration plate was shown, HWL507N. It would turn out that another set of events would be connected to Shirley's disappearance. On the 29th of October 1987, A man walked into a dress shop in Leamington Spa, a town in Warwickshire, around 90 miles away from Bristol. He was wearing a motorcycle helmet and kept it on as he entered the shop. This alarmed the two female employees who attempted to alert someone on the phone. The man told them to stop and took out a knife. One of the women ran out of the door of the shop shouting for help and the man left too, running away. Two passers-by who'd been in the area at the time gave chase and followed the man down the streets. He ducked into several back streets and disappeared behind the church. One of the passers-by flagged down a man who had a car phone and asked him to ring the police. Officers came out and they, along with the two passers-by, looked around the area in the car, however couldn't initially see the suspect. They did find a bag at the back of the church, which contained a motorcycle helmet and a knife. The bag had blood on it and indicated that the suspect may have cut himself on the knife. As they emerged from finding this evidence, they spotted the suspect walking casually down the street, wearing just a shirt, jumper and trousers, and had his hand in his pocket. Officers approached him and asked him to take his hand out so they could see it 
and when he did, it was covered in blood. This was their suspect. He was arrested and his identity finally found. It was John Canaan. When Canaan presented the items from his pockets, he had a set of keys which were found to belong to a black BMW car that had been parked near the dress shop. There was a trail of blood found in a nearby garage, which led them to the toilets. When police lifted the lid on the cistern of the toilet, there was some rope that had been hidden in there. This rope matched the rope that had been found in the glove compartment of the BMW, along with an imitation gun. When the car was forensically searched, they also found other suspicious items, like handcuffs and a briefcase that had been left in there. This briefcase contained a huge piece of evidence. Not in the attack at the dress shop that had just happened, but in the disappearance of Shirley Banks. Canaan had in his possession the tax disc from her mini clubman. This was the first breakthrough in Shirley's case, however it would not be the last. Shortly afterwards, police discovered Shirley's car in a lock-up garage just over the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. The garage was located at a block of flats called Foy House, which was where John Canan lived. It had been repainted blue, and its registration number had been changed to SLP386S. This clearly indicated to police that some harm had come to Shirley and that Canaan knew exactly what had happened to her. They had found their first concrete lead in Shirley's disappearance and their prime suspect. However, they had not found her. Where was Shirley? Following tips that had come in, they began searches in 15 wooded areas and 11 underwater searches were also carried out to try and find her. Helicopters were dispatched to help with aerial views of the areas. Canan insisted that he had nothing to do with Banks' disappearance, telling the police that he had got the car from a Bristol motor auction and that a man called Philip Hodgson or Hodgkinson had bought it and put it in its garage. Police would later say, however, that Canan asked a policeman where the car auction was, proving that he had no real knowledge of it. Through further investigation, it was believed that Shirley had been kept at Canan's flat at Foy House, as a woman from that address phoned for a taxi the day after she disappeared. This was dismissed by Canan when the taxi driver knocked on the door. It was believed that Shirley may have managed to get access to the phone to ring someone for help to get out of there. A fingerprint in Canan's flat also matched hers, confirming she was there. Neighbours also saw him cleaning his car vigorously and he asked to borrow someone's hoover. Despite the fact that Canan still hadn't told the police where Shirley's body was, a member of the public discovered a female body at Dead Woman's Ditch in the Quantock Hills in Somerset, just 48 miles from Bristol. It was found to be Shirley. She had been beaten around the head and forensic investigators found jewellery and buttons from her dress that had been ripped off at the scene. Canan continued to protest his innocence, however he couldn't get round the large amount of evidence that had been presented and he was convicted of her murder in April 1989. This was such a sad end to Shirley's story. However, it was just the beginning of the rumours of a link to Susie Lamplew's case. Newspapers at the time reported on the possible connection between the two, stating that Canaan was in the area at the time of her disappearance, and that he had the means and motive to carry it out. During the time of Shirley Banks' investigation, however, police officers confirmed that they didn't have any evidence to suggest that Canaan had been involved. Susie's parents, however, were convinced by the connection, and Diana, her mother, followed up on leads involving Canaan herself. It's reported that officers did speak to him in relation to Susie's case in 1989. However, this was to try and eliminate him from inquiries, rather than prove the connection. He was also interviewed in relation to the case in 1990 and confirmed that he had re-sprayed Shirley's car and changed the registration plate. He allegedly told police that he knew the man who'd owned the car before him had murdered Shirley 
and also Susie. The new registration plate on Shirley's car also gave rise to a number of theories due to the numbers and letters chosen, SLP 386S. People speculated if SLP could have stood for Susie Lamplew and the 86, the year that she went missing. Some people believe that he'd left a clue in this choice of plate. His comment about the owner of the car being the killer was later recanted. The suspicion continued to swirl around Canaan, but with little evidence to go on, the hunt for Susie went on with other methods of investigation. Witnesses were re-interviewed and more appeals were issued in the hope that someone would come forward with information. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to get any closer to finding Susie and no other suspects were found. Sex offenders in the area were checked and interviewed, but police did not appear to find anyone connected to her. Years went by with little progress made, and despite some indications that a suspect may have been found, there wasn't any evidence and no other suspects had been tracked down either. Thirteen years after Susie initially went missing, the murder review group at Scotland Yard decided to look once again at the investigation into the case. The lack of progress was a concern, and it was hoped that by looking back into the original files, something new might be found. It was discovered, however, that there were major flaws in the 1986 investigation, and this made the police worried. They were particularly disturbed by the lack of interest that Malcolm Hackett had had in John Canaan from the outset, and it was decided that Susie's case would be reinvestigated fully from the beginning. This review led to a reinvestigation starting in 2000, led by Jim Dickey. The reinvestigation was to start at the beginning and try and perhaps pick up on things that had been missed over the years. One of the things that the team needed to do first was to put all of the evidence collected since 1986 on a computerised database. There were reportedly around 26,000 index cards of information in Susie's case, and all of this had to be put in one central database. One of the things that had been noted was that some evidence was incomplete and other pieces of information were simply missing. Getting to the bottom of all the information that they had was key to a good second look at the case. Another avenue that police could now investigate was the new importance that was given to DNA in cold cases. Jim Dickey and his team set about forging a new relationship with the Lamplew family and took DNA samples from them in order to produce a DNA profile for Susie. This profile was then used to compare to any unidentified Jane Doe's that had been found, and to check against any that had been found in the past. As I have reported in many of my other episodes, sadly many unidentified people are found regularly in the UK, and it was important that the police could rule them out as being Susie. Around 800 unidentified women were in mortuaries around the country, and the police had to set about checking on all of these leads. The fact that so many unidentified people go many years or even forever without being identified is such a tragedy, and something that is often overlooked in missing person cases. These leads were looked into, and Susie's family were asked regularly to eliminate these women as Susie. This was clearly an awful situation for them, however at least they were finally getting somewhere with the investigation. An extensive search of the database, however, didn't produce a match to Susie. It would appear that she was not one of these nameless people, and the family continued to hope that she would be eventually found. One of the important new steps in the investigation was to appeal for further witnesses to Susie's disappearance on that day in 1986. Despite the 14-year gap between the crime and the reinvestigation, the police did find witnesses who could help them. One of the witnesses had seen a man standing looking in the window of Sturgis and Sons the day before Susie went missing. Crucially, Susie's desk sat in the window of the estate agency and this sighting could have been important. Another witness stated that they saw a man in a BMW pressing the horn of the car on Stevenage Road where Susie's car was found. 
This witness said that there was a blonde woman also in the car who looked to be either screaming or laughing. The witness couldn't tell. The one thing that these witnesses both had in common was that they had confirmed that it was Canaan that they saw. Police had obtained a video of Canaan that had been filmed for a dating agency that he had joined. The video shows him discussing the type of women that he was interested in and what he looked for in a partner. I'm unsure whether the witnesses were simply shown the video and asked if this was the man or shown a lineup of suspects. It was clear that during the initial investigation he had never been placed in any lineups. Of course, this is important because if they had simply been shown Canaan in 2000 rather than with any other similar men, this would not have been an appropriate witness confirmation. For our police, however, it was another piece of evidence that he had been in the area at the time of Susie's disappearance and possibly in the car with her. In December 2000, police officially made Canaan a suspect in the investigation. He, however, explained that he had an alibi for the day that Susie went missing. He stated that he was in Birmingham that day, chatting up a sales assistant. When police revisited this alibi, the sales assistant reportedly said that she had spoken to Canaan and confirmed this. However, there was some confusion about which day this was. Many years later, people's memories fade, and unfortunately this alibi was not checked thoroughly at the time. In 2002, police sent all of the evidence that they had collected in this reinvestigation to the Crown Prosecution Service. It was hoped that as a lot of the new evidence had not been seen before, it would be enough to indict Canaan. This, however, was not the case. It was found that there was not enough evidence to link Susie's disappearance to Canaan, as they had also not found her body, there was not enough to suggest that he was involved. This was a huge blow to the police, who'd been working for over two years to collate as much information as they could, and in their minds, Canaan was the prime suspect. Detectives spoke at a press conference soon after, stating that Canaan was their prime suspect and that they were very sorry about the way that the original investigation had been carried out. They indicated that their failure to investigate him at the time had had a detrimental effect on the case. The fact that he had been eliminated could have been the difference between finding Susie or not. Over the years, there have been many attempts to try and locate Susie's body, and many areas have been excavated in the hope of recovering her. These areas were related to tips and witnesses that had come forward in the investigation. Norton Barracks in Worcestershire were searched in 2000, and officers also searched the area of Quantock Hills where Shirley Banks' body had been found. Unfortunately, nothing was recovered from these sites. In 2018, police also excavated the garden of a home in Sutton Coalfield that had once belonged to Canaan's mother. This same house had been excavated on smaller scales in 2002, 3 and 4. However, in 2018, a larger scale investigation began. Despite this, nothing was found. Since Susie went missing, there has been nothing found that could point to where she is. In 2019, there was a new witness that came forward with fresh information. A woman explained that a friend of hers, a lorry driver named Dave, had been walking along the Grand Union Canal near Fulham when he had spotted a man coming towards him. It was three days after Susie had disappeared and around 5am. The man was carrying a large piece of luggage on wheels, and Dave stepped back to let him pass. As Dave carried on down the canal, he heard a loud splash. He looked back and saw the man running away, now empty-handed. This sighting had scared Dave, and he went to the Metropolitan Police at the time to report what he had seen. He was, however, not spoken to about the incident, and he felt like the police had not really listened to what he had to say. It would later be found that there was no record of Dave's statement to police and it was not saved as part of the investigation. This could have been a crucial sighting and if it had been looked into at the time, something may have been found in the canal. Dave's friend told the press, Dave went to the police three times about what he saw in 1986 but felt he was never listened to and no action was taken. It troubled Dave for the rest of his life until he died six years ago. 
Why would someone be dumping a suitcase in the canal at that time in the morning? This was a question that police were now asking themselves. Could this be an important lead? Unfortunately, this appeared to be another lead that was not followed up on by police at the time and is tragic for Susie and her family. In 1994, Susie was officially declared dead and her family have had to come to terms with life without her. The Lamplew family have been vocal and instrumental in trying to affect change in relation to personal safety. They set up the Susie Lamplew Trust Charity in 1986 to help raise awareness of stalking and to try and help people avoid becoming victims of aggression. They set up the National Stalking Helpline and help other families of missing people. The Trust has helped many people through training and counselling and has been a lifeline for people in need. Both Paul and Diana Lamplew were awarded OBEs for their work for the Trust and have spent their lives campaigning for justice for Susie and following up on all leads that they could. Sadly, Diana died in 2011 and Paul in 2018 without finding out what happened to their daughter. Since their deaths, the family have continued to appeal for leads in Susie's case, and recently her brother, Richard, has appealed once again. He has recently spoken on the Missing podcast about his sister, stating that he accepts that she's dead, but just wants to find her. He said, All we want is to bury Suze where we want to bury her, and that's as far as we're concerned is the most important thing. The trail is starting to get cold because it was 35 years ago and those people involved in the case are getting quite old. But it's never too late. I'm sure the police will always be willing and the case is kept open. Hopefully one day we'll be able to do that, bury her where we want to bury her. It's evident that her family just want to find her and be able to put her to rest. That's the most important thing to them. Susie's case is absolutely riddled with mystery and there were so many things that we still don't know about her day and what happened when she disappeared. It's clear that she left the office and disappeared at some point on her journey to Sherald's Road and there's evidence that whoever committed this had planned out what they were going to do. Whoever had committed the abduction had also been knowledgeable about how to dispose of Susie's body and knew how to carry it out without being caught or her body being found. This suggests a level of sophistication connected with someone who had done this kind of crime before. The police maintain that John Canan is their main suspect, and this has been the case since 2002. However, without Susie's body, there is little that can be done to connect the two. At the moment, there is no evidence directly linking Canan to Susie, and the case is still open, giving rise to the possibility that someone else committed the crime. Some people believe that the evidence points in a different direction and speculate whether Susie even attended a viewing at Sherald's Road at all that day. The issue is there's little evidence to say what happened to her without finding her body. Canan maintains his innocence in Susie's disappearance and will be up for parole in just two years' time. The family are hoping that this fresh appeal will generate new leads that may find Susie's body. This is the only way that she might get justice and the only way forward in this case. If you know anything about Susie's disappearance, please contact the police investigation at 020-723-04294 or Crime Stoppers at 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I would really like to hear your thoughts and theories, so do connect with me on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. I want to thank, as always, my Patreon supporters. And I want to thank my newest patrons, Joe, Carla and Michael. If you'd like to support the podcast and receive bonus episodes and ad-free early access, then go over to the show notes and click the link. If you just want to leave us a review wherever you listen, that's also always appreciated. Remember, if you want to book tickets for CrimeCon in September, then use my code UNSEEN for 10% off your ticket.
Thank you.